So I have the pleasure of introducing our last, but not least, presenter. And um, it's interesting, this individual um, arrived to the yoga program accosting teachers. Where's the divine feminine? Where's the goddess? Why are we not learning about this? It's like, duh, you're here. You've arrived. And we've developed this relationship. I got to travel with her, but before that we've had these motions and laughter uh, about the various aspects of our interaction with the program and our interactions with each other. Um, she's the embodiment of the divine in my essence and divine feminine with um, some tendencies in the Tantra, which we're not going to. <laughs> but what I loved about her is her deep love of family, especially her two boys, her granddaughter, her family, her mother, her history, her family history. And that was plainly evident in the exhausting shopping spree she <laughs> exposed me to in India. A shirt for them and a shirt for God. This, for my sister, you, she got to have it for my mother, what have you. Are you with people in the bank? What are you talking about? There's money in there, what have you. It was just evident, her ex non, this energy that she had, this this deep, profound sense of love that I, I kind of was missing in my life, you know? I, I have it around me, but you take advantage of it. And she, she awakened me to that. And I just don't know even how to articulate what she means to me, what she meant to everyone in the core But I'll use my grandmother's native language. In La Quesh, it means, Tu eres mi otro yo. You are my other me. Thank you. Aww. So I present <laughs> this incredible um, can someone other than the six-year-old help me get my presentation up on the screen <laughs> although I'm sure she can do that thank you Kike amazing just you know you find a another you in the strangest of places yeah but I knew right away yeah <laughs> thanks Alex minutes, 60 minutes of a theme, uh, a 12-step theme, pranayama, therapeutic asana, and meditation. The leader and all the community uh, introduces himself, and then there's a 30-minute circle. So we come into the we that's really important for wellness. Applied yogic science and treatment for individuals. I have a lot of dogs in my kula, so just bear with me. Um, it's 50 minutes. It's individual treatment. It's I do patient ed education of a Rig Vedic arc, which I'll go into later. Um, I guide people through the eight limbs of yoga. Asana is applied. The session ends with a patient who's able to discern what's going on in her being. And then they have assignments. This is not a yoga therapy thesis. This is about what I've created. Um, I created these two systems because we have a crisis of pain and dukkha. Dukkha is disease in Sanskrit. There are 100 million people in the U.S. who suffer from ongoing pain, a very complicated circumstance. 24 million people suffer from addiction and alcoholism and more are now becoming addicted to pharmaceuticals because they're a diagnosis like bipolar. Um, put on this population. There are uncountable numbers of sports and medical injuries. Um, and there's trauma in that, even if a surgery is for good, or even if you're an athlete who is doing what they love, there's trauma embedded in that. 50 million people are estimated to suffer from painful autoimmune. I work uh, very much with that population, and they're treated with steroids primarily. Uh, treatments are primarily painkillers, group support, physical therapy. And the, um, what's happened is that we have the government announcing that there's an opioid epidemic, which is directly related to our conversation about pain. 
Um, the national, it, it costs the country $78.5 billion yearly. Imagine what we could do with that money, right? Uh, the National Institute of Health is looking for alternative ways to prevent opioid misuse, treat opioid use disorders, and manage pain. I use three texts to support um, the systems. I actually came to LMU to find support for the systems I had created. The first one is uh, the Rig Veda, particularly the creation hymn from 2000 BCE, then the Bhagavad Gita, 1400 BCE. <laughs> there are some arguments about the dates, obviously, of the uh, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. So I split the difference and said 400. <laughs> I don't know, fifth century. Um, also, I went on a phenomenal trip, literally, in search of um, neuroscientific support for my systems with Lori Fazio and Shauna Hughes. Just an amazing trip to uh, witness the, the application of yoga toward medical uh, conditions. We went to Pondicherry, the Center for International Center for Yoga Education and Research, and met with Dr. Ananda Bala Yogi Bhavanani, who will be at Sitta this year in June. He's a doctor and tenth in uh, tenth in the line of gurus in the uh, Gitananda lineage, and then we went to Kavalya Dahama in Lanvala. Um, it's the Institute for Scientific and Literary Research Training and Therapy and Yoga. Just phenomenal what I learned there. Particularly, what I learned is that yoga does not look at diagnosis; it looks at what you practice. Really key. Um, I, I'm going to re define recovery here because I don't in any way pretend that my systems are in place of the medical system, which is so important. Um, but they give a patient the ability to make good decisions. So recovery for the state of, for my thesis is an embodied state of balanced energy, steadiness and ease that we find in Sutra uh, 246, Shtira Sukham Asanam. The ability to reason things out with others, uh, a movement from I self centeredness to we wellness. Pain always creates isolation. I know I lived with chronic pain for at least seven years. Uh, the ability to reframe thoughts and language from negative to positive. And then finally, really important, is a clear perception of current circumstance. Um, I just want to say how I got to this. Um, who knows why this happens? I had no plans to do this with my life at all. I was a journalist. I was fabulous. I wore Chanel. Um, <laughs> you know. My idea of fashion is CIA chic, so my mother insisted I wear this dress. Thank you, Mom. Um, but from the time I was a little girl, I was always searching for a way to fix suffering. It's just what I was looking for. And this is how I see. So if you see on the top, there is a little boat there. That would be you if you're standing in front of me as a patient, right? The boat on the surface. And then what I see, and I think this is unique to me, and, but Julie and I talked about this concept of feel-see, is I see the undercurrent of traumas embedded in the tissue of your body. Like, literally, I've seen that since I was six. Like Dermot, the way your glasses kind of hang on your face, that tells me a lot about you. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's something about glasses, I don't know. Um, and my solution has always been matter over mind, right? To deal with the tissues, to change the thought process. And then when I got to... Um, here and studied with Lori in uh, the science, I began to, and started understanding neuroscience, I realized that, in fact, what I'd always seen is there are three types of pain, they all happen in the amygdala, and then uh, Dr. Ganesh Rao in, at Kaivalya Dhamma, so brilliant, said this, people run away from pain and this running is caused by fear, in the brain, fear, pain, and memory all come from the same place, the amygdala. One of the most important aspects of dealing with pain is discerning what kind of pain it is. Are you in the future? Are you trauma-triggered? Are you in the present? 
current pain. Imagine pain. Remembered pain. It hangs around like a ghost. It needs treatment. It's complicated. The problem, though, is not in your circumstances and sometimes not even in your body. The problem is that your brain is running the show and it's a very disorganized part of your brain. When your brain is in pain, it feels pain, it gets completely disorganized. It's chaos. And that made me understand that um, that was where I really found the doorway to the text and how the text could... Um, change your mind and uh, Dr. Balakar at Kaivalya Dhamma said the Patanjali Sutras and the Bhagavad Gita have this trajectory, change your mind, change your percept and change your experience and I was like there it is, right? Arjuna's journey in the Bhagavad Gita, 100% Ermila, thank you so much for helping us with this translation because I kept having these incredible aha moments where I went, oh my God, his entire journey on the battlefield is a metaphor for an addict or a patient's journey from perception to recovery. In, in uh, the space of, I think it's like 30 seconds in the Gita, um, Arjuna goes from complete despondency and dis depression and despair over his circumstance to the Song of God, these methodologies of yoga coming into his uh, purview through Krishna, and then he's fine, and he moves forward, no change in circumstance. The message is that one can get well despite circumstance when practicing both classical and hatha yoga. Uh, then I was so interested, and this was really an evolving thought process of mine of the cosmic arc and the Rig Veda of Asat, Sat Yajna, Rita Dehi forms, and that actually became the paradigm on which my systems were formed. And I reimagined Yajna, which in uh, Vedic times was a community sacrificial ritual. I reimagined that as the practice of the Patanjali Sutras. So this is what I came up with. I repurposed the eight limbs of yoga as the yamas and the yamas, how to treat the self and others, particularly for addicts and alcoholics and those of us in pain. We become deeply isolated and we are not fun to be with. Asana became therapeutic movement, both applied and practiced. And applied yoga treatment, I apply it on the patients who sometimes can't even walk. Um, pranayama, measured breathing, always works to reduce the whirlpools of the mind. Pratyahara, dis detachment from sensory experience, right? Cravings and pain. Dharana, concentration on the positive and visual refocused thoughts. This concept of imagining po positivity and imagining yourself well, I've actually seen it work. Dhyana meditation to cultivate stillness to reduce fear and worry. That's interestingly the hardest thing to get people to do. And then samadhi I reimagined as embodied ease and comfort, uh, which is the bringing in of the rajas, the tension, the uh, tamas, the lethargy, because you either have that, tamas or rajas, to sattva, which is balance, and they come and go, right? So this is what happened. I realized that asat was actually destabilization. It was the disorganized brain in chaos and vulnerability. And Sutra 1.2, Yoga Chitta Vritta Narodaha, um, really said to me that yoga soothes the brain on fire. <laughs> the, and the amygdala is running the show. And then Dr. Bhavanani was so graceful and beautiful. He said, if you can't be in the pain, you're not going to get well. And to me, that was sought. Acceptance of the truth, willingness to fill the fire without trying to fix it or mask it. And then he defined Sutra 1.3 as, until we experience and accept our condition, we cannot get well. And acceptance is the doorway of clarity. So you see why I say if you're unhappy, or if you're destabilized, I'm happy for you. Because this is the doorway. And then uh, the practicing of the eight limbs of yoga to create discernment 
for the type of pain you have. It just works. The yamas, the niyamas, the asana, the pranayama. Notice that asana is first. There's a road map to all of this. Um, dharana, detachment, dhyana, meditation, and then finally samadhi, balance. And then Ritta Dehi is a new perception of the self. That's how I repurpose that. A recovering sense of self, one's purpose. Uh, Lori and I talked so much about getting when you get right perception, you get your purpose in life. Really important. And that's when the prefrontal cortex is back in play. It's your reasoning brain. The um, joy, purpose, and embodied stability. The final sutra, Chris really drummed this in, which was so amazing in his book, Yoga and the Luminous, about how the final state has to be an embodied state, right? It has to be an embodied state of ease. And Dr. Bhavanani called that a psychophysiological vehicle. This is me and my granddaughter. Whenever we are together, we're happy. Uh, the healing power of the sutras is driven by an increasing <coughs> subtilization of the practitioner, in this case, in the patient, which brings her to a state of, thank you for using her, Chris, which brings her to a state of wholesome discernment and re-perspectiving of given circumstances. That was from Professor Chapel. When we studied the Patanjali sutras, I just kept going, oh my God, oh my God, this is... Uh, the proof that I need for the systems I've created and the systems I plan to take out of LMU into the world. Because um, illness makes us isolated. I know that feeling. How about you? And then weakness makes us feel well. Thank you, India. That's my tribe. I'm not looking for the dogs. And thank you, my beloved friends. It's been so great. Thank you so much. There they go. Any questions? Cool. Everything clear? Okay, Chris, yay, thank you. What surprised you most this trip to India? Um, I think the, um, honestly, the thing that surprised me the most was the freedom of the dogs. I was prepared, my girlfriends in the cohort prepared me to suffer over the dogs, and I've never seen freer or happier dogs. It was really quite incredible. Um, and also, um, this, um, the therapeutics doesn't begin with diagnosis, it begins with practice. That, to me, was just deeply, deeply profound. But the dogs, the dogs are everything. <laughs> Lori? I know you've worked with so many, uh, patients. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that's a great question. Thank you so much. I have, um, I have um, a, a male patient who's a pretty phenomenal athlete. He's a skier. And um, he's had a couple of, I found this later, so I'm telling you from hindsight. Um, he's had a couple of really deep traumas. His mother committed suicide, and um, he had a pretty severe peroneal tear. And, um, and then uh, a year ago, he came down with PMR, which is one of those conditions where literally he was in so much pain he couldn't walk anywhere in his body. And so I work at a place called Attune, which is um, an autoimmune and inflammation research and care facility. You know about that. And they send me the patients who um, are really 
crotchety and wouldn't possibly ever believe in yoga. So they sent me to this guy and said, do your thing. And anyway, so um, he was so destabilized that he was really able to surrender himself to the process that he and I had to go through. And um, today, he was on 60 million milligrams of prednisone. Today, this week, he just got off it completely. That's in six months. And he's, this is how he talks. He, he says, it's your fault, Abby, that I'm off prednisone. Um, and, but the amazing thing is that he has said to me, um, basically what I did was I created space in his body uh, through manual manipulation and I, uh, meditation and pranayama and um, the eight limbs. And also, um, I always explain to people that destabilization is a very critical doorway. Um, and so now he is skiing fully, walking fully, and um, is free of PMR, and he's still cranky, um, but, um, you know, he's pain-free. So, and I've had, um, I've had quite a few of those who, but what I wanted to say was he is completely aware, and he actually said to me, this to me the other day, he said, do you think if you'd come to me a year ago, and we could have created this kind of space in my body, I would have gotten better faster. And I said, you come when you come, right? So yeah, it's, it's working. I, you know, if patients are not destabilized oddly, they won't buy in. So I need that arc from the destabilization to recognition of how destabilized to willingness to practice to back to purpose. That arc has to be there. I don't use any Sanskrit, but I do, do say to them, this is the arc we're dealing with. You're completely destabilized. Let's go. Lucky you. Yeah? So I'm interested how and I'm getting you back for your question. Okay. I'm interested how you communicate the philosophy. Maybe the philosophies that are so deeply embedded in this practice now, after this program, to your patients. I mean, how do That's you such a great patients? question, because um, you guys know me, right? When a person is on my table, they're my hostage. <laughs> and um, I um, communicate, well... Here's the thing, I've been working with, I want to say, problematic populations for quite a long time. I work with, um, and what I mean is people who are super destabilized. So, um, I work with uh, crystal meth addicts, I work with a lot of HIV, I work with the homeless population, homeless youth. You know, I, I'm, uh, I'm a street practitioner, and then in the attuned space, I'm working with very, very rich people. So um, my thing is, I don't have time to be disconnected through language. And I've been teaching long enough so that I know exactly what to say in a way that doesn't scare people. Because the first thing that if I bring, if I say sutra, they're gone. Um, if I say we have a plan, it's gonna be simple, it's small. That to me is the sutra. So or if I say I have an idea for you, it's simple, it's small. <laughs> you know, and that's it. And then, but once, I usually have people who are like six months or longer, I mean I have, a population that I've been working with for, God, Frankie, 12 years. Um, and now they know, and now they can hear some of, some of the Sanskrit. And actually, that's really gratifying. And they love the neuroscience. They love it. Because I find that once people understand their brain on fire, like, they'll go, oh, what's the word for that? So, 
Um, but I go direct, you know, I'm like, let's just get right there and you don't need fancy language. Yeah, but it's, yeah, great question. Is that it? <laughs> Francis. Can you talk a little bit more about 11 Step Yoga, its um, impact on the recovery community mm -hmm. and how it's brought people to a yoga practice that had none before? Yeah, I mean, 11 Step Yoga is really interesting because it's not about the yoga. Um, when I first started it, I was with a guy, I had a partner who uh, thought it was all about the yoga and um, he wouldn't let two people in who uh, were shaky dirty and wanted to wear their shoes. And for me, <laughs> and we parted ways right away, because for me it, it is not at all about the asana is what I want to say. 11-step um, yoga is a true combination of the 12 steps of addiction recovery. Um, and in that I include alcoholism and I also include friends of. And um, we follow the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, it took us many years to get sanctioned by Alcoholics Anonymous and be in their meeting book. Um, the yoga it depends on the room. I mean, I do a teacher training. It's a 50-hour training. It's volunteer. No one um, pays for it. And um, we do very basic asana that's meant to affect the uh, serotonin, dopamine, and tryptophan uptake. So we do a lot of forward bending postures, twists, and then we also address the central nervous system with back bends. Um, it's very choreographed. Um, I have had people coming in um, who were shaky and detoxing and were all equipped to understand how to deal with that. I actually had someone at once we were practicing pranayama and um, uh, they were smoking like this. Or maybe it was like this. Um, I've seen it all in that program. But we are in five studios. And um, always looking for people who want to be trained to teach this. It's an incredible gift back. It's probably, is it, did I answer your question? Yes. Yeah, it's in five studios. It's 11stepyoga.com. Um, and soon, uh, hopefully, we'll have 11 Step Yoga Daily Meditations for Recovery. Um, it's pretty cool. It's really my heart's legacy and the, the uh, neuroscience here just uh, threw that on fire, so. Yeah? Good? Good. Everybody good? good. Okay. I didn't make you practice anything, it's not awesome. <laughs>